I'm here to see how things are going. How things are going. Joachim, we haven't seen you in months. Lucas Oliveira's family home is simple and somewhat worn, filled with mismatched furniture. The small living room is cluttered with old family photographs, some cracked and faded with age. A palpable tension hangs in the air. Lucas, a young man in his late teens, sits on the couch, staring intently at the floor. Beside him, his younger sister, Helena, is quietly drawing, blissfully unaware of the tension surrounding them. Across from them, their mother, Belladonna Oliveira, is engaged in a serious conversation with their father, Joe Aquam Oliveira, who has arrived unexpectedly and seems to come and go as he pleases. You know how it is, Bella. I've been busy with responsibilities. Lucas clenches his fists, staring hard at the floor, refusing to look at his father. I have a lot of responsibilities, Bella. You know that. Responsibilities? You mean your other family? The one you live with while we scrape by? You know that I didn't plan any of this. You are aware of my situation. I can't change things now. I'm trying to help where I can. Lucas, finally speaking, coldly. Help. You call this helping. Dropping by once in a while, leaving us with nothing but empty promises. I'm doing my best, Lucas. Life's not easy, and you'll understand that when you're older. I understand enough. I understand that you abandoned us. I understand that you chose them over us. Hello, my dearest daughter, Helena. My sunshine. Papa, are you staying this time? Not this time, dearest. But I will come back soon. Soon. You always say that. What do you want from me, Bella? I'm here now, aren't I? We want more than just visits. We want a present father, a husband. Someone who cares for this family, Joachim. Someone who doesn't leave us to fend for ourselves while he plays house with another woman. How dare you raise your voice at me, woman. Lucas steps forward, fists clenched at his sides, barely containing his anger. You made your choice a long time ago. You left us behind. Don't pretend you're doing us any favors by showing up now. Life isn't black and white, Lucas. I can't be in two places at once. You think it's easy. You think I want this. I don't care what you want, Papa. You think we don't see the truth. We're just the leftovers. You come here when it's convenient. You don't care about us. How dare you speak to me like that? Bella moves between them, her voice shaking with anger and sadness. Go, Joachim. If you're not going to stay, just go. I don't want to keep fighting like this. Joaquin pauses, looking at Bella, then Lucas, and finally Helena. He sighs deeply, guilt in his eyes, but he doesn't argue anymore. I'll be back soon, I promise. He turns and walks out the door without looking back. Bella slumps into a chair, tears in her eyes. Lucas stands there, fists still clenched, seething with frustration. Promises. That's all he ever leaves us with. I wish I didn't believe him every time. Helena looks up at her mother, confused but sensing the tension. She goes back to drawing, quietly whispering to herself. He'll come back soon, won't he, Mama? Bella tries to be strong for her daughter. Yes, my dearest. He always comes back. Bella wipes her eyes and forces a smile for her daughter, before she finds comfort in food. Lucas stands by the window, watching as his father walks away. The weight of his broken family presses down on him. 
As Joaquim Oliveira walks out of the house, he bumps into Conceição Ferreira, the neighborhood gossiper. She wears brightly colored clothes and an exaggerated expression of curiosity. She spots Joaquim and immediately her eyes widen with glee. Joaquim, leaving already. Off to see Katerina Pinta, are you? Joaquim gives her a curt nod, avoiding eye contact, and quickly walks away. Kunsaisao watches Joaquin leave with a smug look, then immediately hurries toward the house, knocks lightly and then lets herself in without waiting for a response. Bella Oliveira is sitting at the kitchen table, trying to regain her composure after Joaquin's departure. Lucas stands by the window, still fuming. I saw Joaquin leaving. It's such a shame. Such a shame. Off to see Katerina Pinter, is he? Bella stiffens, not meeting Kunsaisao's eyes. Lucas turns slightly, his expression growing darker. I don't want to talk about it, Conseisao. Kunsai Sao, ignoring her, sitting down and invited. You know, Katrina Pinter is doing quite well for herself. Independent mother of five, runs her own kiosk, living in that nice house her late husband left her. No wonder Joachim is spending his time there. Bella remains silent, gripping the edge of the table tightly. Lucas takes a step forward, his eyes narrowing. But you, Bella, you refuse to divorce him, even after all these years, after he's cheated on you, abandoned you. You still believe he's your husband, don't you? That he'll come back to you one day. Bella's lip trembles, but she stays silent. Concise words sting like salt in an open wound. Do you really think Joachim still belongs to you? Or is it that you just want him to keep supporting you and the kids with his meager salary, while Katerina Pinter's money helps too? Bella tries to respond, but her voice catches in her throat. Lucas clenches his fists, trying to hold back his anger. Look at the women in this neighborhood, Bella. They're out there working, starting businesses. Why don't you do the same? Your days of being a kept woman are over. Can't you see what living off a man does to a person? Lucas finally snaps, stepping forward to confront her. That's enough. You have no right to come here and talk to us like this. Oh, Lucas, I'm just trying to help. Bella needs to wake up and see that God is our provider, not men. In the Bible, we're told to work with our own hands, to run our own businesses. It's written in 1 Thessalonians 4.11. 1 Thessalonians 4 11 to 12 KJV says, and I quote, and that ye study to be quiet, and to do your own business, and to work with your own hands, as we commanded you, that ye may walk honestly toward them that are without, and that ye may have lack of nothing. Are you really going to preach to us about the Bible, you, of all people? Kunsaisao's smug smile falters slightly, sensing the shift in the room. You run a pub, Conchechal. You date several men, and the whole neighborhood knows it. Don't stand here pretending you're some kind of son, picking and choosing which scriptures to follow. You can't claim to be a Christian when your own life is a mess. Conchechal flushes with embarrassment, her composure slipping. Bella looks up, startled by Lucas' outburst, but grateful for his defense. I, I'm only speaking the truth. Then go speak it somewhere else. We don't need your advice. Lucas points at the door. Kunsaisao glares at him, humiliated, and hurriedly gathers her things, moving toward the door. You'll see, Lucas. One day, you'll understand. Out. 
She exits the house quickly, closing the door behind her. The room falls into silence. Bella exhales shakily, her emotions still raw. Thank you, my son. I didn't know how much more I could take. We don't need people like her in our lives, Mama. We'll make it, one way or another. Bella nods, still shaken but comforted by Lucas' strength. Carla Mendes' office. Carla Mendes is sitting behind a sleek, modern desk in her luxurious office. She's elegantly dressed in an expensive suit. Paula Fonseca, her efficient assistant, stands nearby, taking notes. Carla's demeanor is cold yet confident, her eyes betraying a hunger for more power. Paula, what's the latest on the CEO's health? Paula Fonseca, nervously checking her tablet. Ah, he's still on medical leave. The board is talking about a potential successor. Perfect timing. I've been preparing for this moment for decades. Do you really think the board will choose you, Carla? There are rumors. People are starting to question how you've climbed so fast. Rumors are for the weak, Paula. What they don't know won't hurt them. And what they think they know, well, that's just a distraction. Paula hesitates, looking uncomfortable, but continues taking notes. But don't you think it's risky? People are talking about your relationships with the board members. Let them talk. I didn't come this far to care about petty whispers. I've worked. No, I've fought for this position, Paula. Some people spend years in university. I found a more efficient path. One that works. But, Carla, most of those relationships didn't exactly end well. They ended exactly as they were supposed to. Contracts end. Marriages end. Business, Paula, is about knowing when to cut ties and move on. Carla's hand drifts over to a pile of ornate books on her desk, strange titles with symbols on the covers, books she's been reading fervently. Paula glances at the books. You've been reading a lot of those lately. Some of the things you've mentioned sound a bit strange. Carla Mendes, her gaze darkening as she traces the cover of one of the books. Strange to you, maybe. But these teachings, these secrets, are the real power behind the wealth and influence of the elite. Real knowledge, Paula, knowledge that opens doors. But aren't you worried? All those new beliefs and strange ideas, people are saying they're dangerous. That, that some of the teachings and ideologies in those secret societies, new religions, and all those strange books and gurus are satanic, serving as gateways or portals to evil. Dangerous, please. They're the reason I'm the group VP and group managing director, and I'm about to become the group CEO. These people cling to their little superstitions, but it's the books, the knowledge, that separate the powerful from the powerless. I've read things that would blow your mind. Paula shifts uncomfortably, glancing at the books again, sensing something off. But sometimes, it feels like something's changed in you. Since you started reading those books, I don't know how to explain it, but... What you don't understand is that change is necessary for growth. If I stayed the same, I'd be just like everyone else in this company, ordinary. And you think I got to this chair by being ordinary? There's a brief silence, the atmosphere in the room growing tense. I just hope you're careful, Carla. People say those books, they open you up to things. Things you might not want to let in. Those people are weak, Paula. They live in fear because they don't understand power. But I do. And I will have it, no matter what it takes. Polly hesitates but nods, knowing she won't get through to Carla. As she gathers her things to leave, Carla's gaze returns to the books, a strange gleam in her eyes. Paul leaves the office, the door closing softly behind her. Carla picks up one of the strange books, her fingers brushing over the ancient symbols, eyes gleaming with dark ambition. This is just the beginning. Carla Mendes' opulent living room. The room is tastefully decorated with expensive art and luxurious furniture. Carla Mendes, dressed in a striking designer gown, sits on a plush sofa, a glass of wine in hand. 
Across from her sits Junior, a member of a secret society, equally well-dressed and exuding an air of confidence. They speak in hushed tones, the atmosphere thick with tension and ambition. You know, Junior, people around here love to whisper. They call me the Ice Queen, so cold, so calculating. But they have no idea what it took to get here. Oh, they talk all right, especially about your past. Carla da Silva, then Carla Rocha, Carla Moreira, and now you're the recently divorced Carla Mendes. It's quite the reputation you've built. Reputation, more like a necessary strategy. Men are so easily distracted by their egos. When I was with those board members, what were their names again? Ah, yes, Thompson, Russo, they left their wives, destroyed their families, all for a taste of my ambition. And for what? Just to see those marriages end. They didn't think it through. But you... You always did what was needed. You took what they had to offer and moved on. Exactly. They were stepping stones, Junior. But people forget that behind every successful woman is a string of men who underestimated her. The fear they feel, it's palpable. Even the most respectable men and women in the company bend over backward to show me their respect. It's quite amusing, really. She leans in closer, her voice lowering conspiratorially. They're terrified of me, you know. Terrified of what I might do next. It's like they believe I have a secret weapon. And do you? What's your secret? Carla's gaze sharpens as she gestures to a nearby shelf filled with the strange, ornate books she collects. Unbeknownst to her, each one serves as a portal to dark knowledge, masquerading as ancient declarations and wisdom from the enlightened, secrets of the great, or modern insights. These books, Junior, they teach me things. Unconventional things. Things that give me an edge over them. They have no idea that my power comes from something much deeper than just my charm. By the way, I bought most of these books from our society's online store. I've heard rumors about those books. They say they're dangerous. Do you think it's worth the risk? I only joined the elitist society for networking. I am not into all this new religious mumbo-jumbo and new beliefs. Every risk has its reward. The pain I've caused, it's just collateral damage. And every time I rise higher, I can feel their fear growing. It fuels me. She stands and moves toward the window, looking at her beautiful garden, her reflection mirroring the ambition in her eyes. Those men left their wives for me, believing they'd find power through association. But in the end, they were just pawns in my game. And when I was done with them, I moved on, leaving broken families in my wake. I've mastered the art of ascension. Junior watches her, a mixture of admiration and wariness in his eyes. And what about the others? Those who work in the shadows. They might not be as easy to manipulate as the board members. Let them come. They have their own secrets to protect, and in this game, secrets can be deadly. I've learned to use fear to my advantage. Those who cross me, they pay the price. It's all part of the dance. What they don't understand is that every practice I adopt, Every spiritual lesson I absorb, it's all part of a greater plan. A plan that will soon elevate me beyond their reach. You really believe you can take the top spot in this company? With everything you've done? Not just believe, I know. The CEO position will be mine. And when it is, all those who doubted me will wish they hadn't. The two share a moment of silence, the weight of her ambition hanging heavy in the air, as the shadows in the room seem to deepen, echoing Carlos' dark desires. home, the room is dimly lit, with the soft hum of the township outside. Bella Oliveira is holding a tattered marriage certificate in her hands. She looks lost, staring at the paper as if it holds all her hopes. Lucas João Oliveira, her son, stands by the doorway, watching her with concern. He approaches slowly, sitting down next to her. Mama, you can't keep living like this. Joachim, he's not coming back. You know that, don't you? Bella clutches the marriage certificate tighter, shaking her head, her voice trembling with emotion. He is my husband, Lucas. We made vows, till death do us part. He's still my husband. Mama, please, you need to stop using food to cope with your pain. Every time you're hurting, 
You reach for something to eat instead of seeking the Lord. You believe in Him, right? So why not turn to prayer and godly counsel? Instead of escaping your suffering through binge eating, learn to walk with the Lord and run to Him, even when times are tough. Finding alternative ways to cope with your pain will only lead to more issues, potentially leading you down a path of destruction. Our pastor has been preaching about this. Our pastor, he's been warning us that many turn to unhealthy habits. Some of us use food as a crutch, while others worship other gods, turn to idols, consult horoscopes and fortune tellers, or even seek guidance from spirit mediums. There are those who engage in synchronism, trying to worship both God and other spirits, because they feel that God has delayed in answering them. Others resort to promiscuity, self-harm, or harmful substances like drugs and alcohol to numb their pain. Some even drift towards atheism simply because they struggle to wait on the Lord and endure their suffering. I know it's easier said than done, but it's the truth, Mama. I, too, face challenges in trusting God when I'm hurting. That's why I'm attending the weekly sermons our church is holding this month on the topic of suffering and faith. Perhaps we could go to the next one together. Bella hesitates, her fingers clutching the marriage certificate tightly before she starts eating again, seeking solace in the familiar comfort of food. Mama, I know what you believe, but a piece of paper doesn't make a marriage. He's abandoned us, he's living with someone else, building a life that doesn't include us. He's not coming back. Bella's eyes well up with tears as she looks at the marriage certificate, as if it's the last thread connecting her to the past. But he's supposed to provide for us. That's what a husband does, Lucas. I stayed home, I took care of you and Helena. I did everything I was supposed to. And now... Now he's gone, and I have nothing. Lucas' face hardens as he listens, feeling the weight of his mother's despair. He pauses for a moment, choosing his words carefully. Mama, a man can't be your provider. God is. You put all your trust in Joachim, and look where that's left us. You need to trust in God, not him. Bella shakes her head, brushing away a tear that has escaped her. She reflects on her life. Realizing that she has spent her entire adult existence depending on Joak Wim, her high school sweetheart and the father of her children. The weight of her reliance on him feels heavier than ever, deepening her sense of loss and longing. I can't. I need him. I don't know how to live without him. He's my husband. He's not your husband anymore, Mama. He's someone else's. And you're holding on to this idea of him, this idea that he's going to come back and fix everything. But he's not, and the longer you hold on to that, the more it's going to hurt. Belladonna looks up at him, her eyes filled with sorrow, but also a glimmer of fear as reality begins to sink in. So what am I supposed to do? How do I live without him? You start by letting go. You start by realizing that we don't need him to survive. We have each other, and I'm going to take care of you and Helena. But you have to stop waiting for him. You have to stop believing that he's coming back. Bella looks at her son, her heart breaking at the thought of letting go. She hesitates, unsure if she can truly do what Lucas is asking. But it's so hard, Lucas. I don't know how to be strong like you. I'm not strong, Ma. I'm just trying to do what's right. I'm trying to get us through this. I'm going to work hard get my education, and we'll move out of here. We'll live in the suburbs, in a nice house, and we won't have to depend on anyone. But I need you to believe that we can do this without Joachim. Bella's eyes search his face, looking for hope in his words. She takes a deep breath, slowly releasing the tight grip she has on the marriage certificate. It falls to the floor. I don't know if I can. You can, Mama, one step at a time. God will take care of us, but we have to take that first step. Trust him, not Joachim. Bella nods weakly, the tears still flowing, but the weight on her shoulders beginning to lift, just a little. I'm going to make it, Mama. 
I promise, and when I do, we'll have a life you can be proud of. But for now, you have to let him go. Disclaimer notice. Please note that the script of this series, and all past and future films on this channel, provides a fictionalized dialogue inspired by true events. The content has been adapted for dramatic purposes, with significant changes made to the script and characters, while maintaining the essence of the original story. Any similarities to persons, living or deceased, or actual events are purely coincidental. Thank you for your understanding and support. CGN Thank you for joining us for this episode of Way to Destiny. If you haven't already, we invite you to subscribe and become part of our growing community. By liking and sharing our videos, you help spread the message, and we truly appreciate your support in making that possible. In today's episode, we witnessed two lives on very different paths, yet each profoundly lost in their own struggles. Bella clings to a past that no longer serves her, placing her hope in a man who has long abandoned her, while Carla Mendez pursues power at any cost, leaving a trail of destruction in her wake. Bella's story reminds us of the dangers of misplaced dependency. Though God created marriage as a sacred covenant, he never intended for us to make idols of human relationships. Bella's pain is real, but in her desperation, she has forgotten that God is her true provider, not Joaquim. By clinging to a broken marriage, she has distanced herself from the healing that comes through trusting in God's provision. Instead of seeking Him, she seeks solace and food, much like how many of us turn to temporary comforts when life's trials seem unbearable. As believers, we are called to walk by faith, especially in times of suffering. We must remember that God's timing is perfect, and His plans are always for our good, even when the answers to our prayers seem delayed. Lucas's advice to his mother is rooted in biblical truth, waiting on the Lord isn't passive, it's an active pursuit of his presence. In times of pain, we must resist the temptation to numb ourselves with worldly distractions. Whether it be food, substances, or even false spiritual practices, these things only lead us further away from the peace and freedom found in Christ. Carla Mendez's life, on the other hand, shows us the dangerous consequences of seeking power and wealth through unethical and immoral means. Her relentless ambition, fueled by pride and deceit, is a stark reminder that earthly success achieved at the expense of others comes at a high cost. Though she may seem invincible to those around her, Carla is spiritually bankrupt, opening herself up to dark forces through her pursuit of forbidden knowledge and occult practices. What she doesn't realize is that the more she seeks power through these paths, the more she becomes enslaved to the very spirit she invites into her life. In this contrast, we are reminded of Jesus' words, For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? Mark 8.36 True power and fulfillment come not from controlling others or gaining worldly possessions, but from surrendering to God's will and walking in his light. Carla's choices serve as a warning for us all. When we seek to fill our hearts with anything other than God, we only invite destruction. Let us, as a community, learn from both Bella and Carla. When life's hardships seem unbearable, may we run to the Lord, who is our refuge and strength. When ambition and success tempt us, may we remember that the only lasting treasure is found in God's kingdom. In all things, let us strive to grow closer to Christ, who alone can heal our brokenness and guide us into a life of true purpose and peace. Before we conclude this episode, we would like to share the following verses for you to reflect upon. Please note that they are taken from the King James Version of the Holy Bible. Dependency on God, not on people. Jeremiah 17, 5 says, Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man and maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departeth from the Lord. Philippians 4.19 says, But my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Psalm 118.8 says, It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. Waiting on the Lord and trusting in his timing. Isaiah 40.31 says, But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. 
they shall run, and not be weary, and they shall walk, and not faint. Psalm 27, 14 says, Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart, wait, I say, on the Lord. Lamentations 3.25-26 says, The Lord is good unto them that wait for him, to the soul that seeketh him. It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. The Dangers of Worldly Ambition and Deceit Mark 8.36 says, For what shall it profit a man, if he shall gain the whole world, and lose his own soul? 1 Timothy 6, 9-10 says, but they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil. And Proverbs 16.18 says, Pride goeth before destruction, and an haughty spirit before a fall. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you today, acknowledging that you are the source of all that we need. You alone are our provider, our comforter, and our guide. Forgive us, Lord, for the times when we have placed our trust in people or things of this world instead of in you. We confess that we are often impatient, seeking quick solutions to our pain and struggles, but we know that only you can truly satisfy the longings of our hearts. Lord, your word reminds us that those who wait upon you will renew their strength. We pray for the strength to trust in your perfect timing, even when it feels like our waiting is in vain. Help us to remember that your plans for us are always for our good, even when we don't understand. Teach us to lean not on our own understanding, but to acknowledge you in all our ways, knowing that you will direct our paths. Father, we ask for discernment to avoid the temptations of worldly gain, ambition, and deceit. Let us be content in knowing that our worth is found in you alone, and not in what this world offers. Guard our hearts from the love of money, power, or status, and help us to seek first your kingdom and righteousness, trusting that all we need will be added unto us. Lord, for those who are suffering today, whether from broken relationships, financial struggles, or emotional pain, we pray for your peace that surpasses all understanding. Comfort them in their affliction, and let them find their refuge in you. Help us all to endure hardship with grace knowing that you are working all things together for our good and your glory. We surrender our lives to you, Father. Strengthen our faith, increase our hope, and fill us with your love, so that we may shine as lights in this dark world. May your will be done in our lives, and may we bring honor to your name in all that we do. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray, Amen. Thank you for watching. Remain blessed.